right? So now we start um, moving towards the idea of a market. Um, it's a, a the, what the study of a market is. It's pretty much what economists do. So you can imagine that it would be there will be a lot of topics in this area. Uh, we will explore the most important of them in this today and next week. So first, how do you get from asking questions like do you like apples more than oranges to a what we call a demand curve? Huh? So what we did, um, so what we have in the previous uh, in the first part is that we have utility, we have preference. And, prefer and we assign numbers to the pre uh, to objects that tells us, well, do you like this more than that? Higher numbers means better. And, that's re and we use a function, utility function, to represent that. And imagine we do the same calculations as we did in the first part, where you, you, keep, asking you keep asking people, do you want to buy this at this price? Do you want to buy that at that price? You can, now, theoretically, you can do it with every price level and every quantity, right? It's just going to take you a lot of time, but theoretically you can do it. Practically, obviously, you're not going to try to ask every single question. You're going to try to extrapolate, but in theory, you could ask people, how, what do you want at every single price level for every single quantity? You just, it just takes time. And when you do that, you have points. You have, you give you that, the, the answer gives you sort of a relationship between how much the individual would buy at a certain price. You just have to ask them, well, what do you want to buy at a particular price? So you ask for different prices and they tell you different quantities. And these come from the utility function that these come from the utility function. Right? You have all these relationships between price and quantity. What we call it is that um, we what we call the we call this quantity demand. That's what people want at that price. That doesn't mean that they can buy it. Since if you ask people, um, how many iPhones do you want? If iPhones are like fifty dollars each, well, I will give you a bunch. But obviously, no one is ever going to be able to buy that, right? Because iPhones don't cost way more than fifty dollars. But that's what people want. So that's called quantity demand. And if you have a lot of points. You, you will start seeing a, a, a relationship between price and quantity. And we call that a demand curve. Demand curve is this combination of relationships between price and quantity demand. And we usually draw it as a line. So technically, it doesn't have to be a line, but we, uh, the, the, it seems reasonable to say at one price, they would, you would tell me that's a quanti particular quantity you want to buy. So it's going to be a line. So in the real world, what do you do? In our this uh, hypothetical exercise, we have this utility function. You can just calculate the utility values and figure out what the, what the points are. In reality, obviously, you don't know what happening, what's happening in people's minds. So that's not how you do it in reality. Instead, you would have to estimate demand from data. So how do you get data? One way is to actually sell a copy of the item in concern, right? You could get data, or you could just look at historical records, right? See what, what, how, how much the products go for. To the, these days, data are easy to come by. You have websites like Amazon, eBay, Taobao. They are, all have data on hundreds, millions of items. So that's how you know what people would be willing to pay for at different prices because uh, transaction prices are usually not constant throughout time and different sellers so you know you can't you have an idea what people are willing to pay for now this is impractical for some items because not ever, what if you have a new product what if you, what if you are trying to sell in a new place what do you do um, in these cases, you usually uh, consult purchase records of items, similar items. And for example, there are companies that provide that. Besides, um, 
So besides these newcomers like Amazon and um, Taobao, you have some you have marketing research company like Nielsen. So Nielsen is one of the largest marketing research firm in the world, and they have this they have this um, service called HomeScan. What they what this does is that Nielsen have house have have households and fam, uh, has households that are in their they are under their pay and those households record what they purchase in hong kong i believe Nielsen has something like a thousand and five hundred families mm -hmm. and these families have a like they they have uh, Nielsen give them a barcode scanner and a little book that they can record whatever they purchase they get paid so in return this record is what Nielsen used to provide marketing research uh, to clients right so this is what we know about how much people pay for like uh, shampoos and uh, or conditioners right? based on our records. Um, what about well, companies themselves also do research? Why do you think you get rewards from these schemes, right? Octopus reward, pop and shop money back. These are reward schemes where you don't need to pay anything to join, and yet they provide you with benefits. How come? The reason is whenever you sign up for these services, somewhere in the agreement, which you certainly have not read, would tell you you agree to to for you agree to the collection of your purchase records. That's why. With now without the without the without the reward card, you might be paying cash, right? You might be using different credit cards or using Octopus cards. It's very hard for the sell the, for the seller for the retailer to link up all your purchase. But if you have a rewards card, usually the more you you always use the same reward card because you need you need to accumulate in order to to get any benefit. So that gives them a very easy way to collect your data. That's the that's why you have all these rewards. It turns out the same reason is as we will talk about probably next week is the same reason is is the the collection of data. It's the reason why you get free service from free services from Facebook and Google. Right? You don't pay Facebook, you don't pay Google. Yet they provide you so much, right? Gmail, like all these Facebook feeds. Why? Because so when you sign up somewhere in the long agreement, where, which once again you probably never read, it, you would have agreed to, to Facebook and Google collecting your data. In fact, if you're using Gmail, you, you agree to G Google reading all your email enormously. But they do, yeah, it reads all your email. So the most famous, the most famous. Um, idea in economics arguably would be the law of demand which says that as price of something goes up people tend to buy less of it right so that's that's the law of demand price goes up you buy less the most famous idea is probably also the most intuitive right but then once you mention this law people will start coming up with violations for example uh, we don't have a cost textbook so but of course textbook like for something similar to what we talk about, we typically sell for like a five three hundred and fifty dollars in Hong Kong, but something like over a thousand Hong Kong dollars. A typical textbook in US would cost you hundreds of US dollars. Uh, like, but in Hong Kong, it costs hundreds of Hong Kong dollars. Yet students in the United States are way more likely to buy textbooks than students in Hong Kong. Like. When I when I taught in the United when I taught in the United States, almost every student would have a textbook. In Hong Kong, yeah, you can't even you can't force students to buy textbooks. They would complain a lot. So expensive, right? Now, is that a violation of law of demand? Like, textbooks are more expensive in the United States, but then somehow people are people are willing to buy it, whereas in Hong Kong they don't. What would be the difference between Hong Kong and United States, in, at least in terms of a university education. How much do you pay to study here? 
as a local student. Forty thousand Hong Kong dollars a year. How much does it does it cost to study in the United States? Forty thousand U.S. dollars, right? So think about it. The cost of a textbook is a tiny fraction. It's a tiny fraction of your of the price of education. It's like nothing compared to your tuition. Textbook is the textbook might cost you two hundred U.S. dollars, but your tuition is four hundred. Now this is if your tuition is forty thousand U.S. dollars a year. Right, so that's not two hundred is nothing in comparison. But in Hong Kong, it's forty thousand Hong Kong dollars. Suddenly, four hundred textbooks seems a bit more a bit expensive, right? And not to mention, some students would be paying even less due to scholarships and grants. So, uh, in the law of demand, as uh, only holds when you hold everything constant. So you not you cannot compare two groups of people like that and say it's a violation. Instead, you should ask if textbooks become more expensive in the United States, is it more likely or less likely for students to buy textbooks? I'm think I think it's fair to say if textbooks become more expensive in the United States, students would be less likely to buy textbooks. So that's not that's exactly what law of demand is saying. Now, given that the given the scenario is the same, if price goes up, what would people do? They would buy less. So that's what law of demand is about. Same situation, price changing. So, law of demand is very it's very powerful. On September 11 and September 2011, if you recall, that would be that would be um, uh, so that's after the uh, that's after the that's a few years after the financial crisis. And it's the worst has the worst is face is starting to this worst has started to pass. And so the Switzerland Central Bank announced a minimum exchange rate of 1.2 Swiss franc to one euro. So it's a minimum exchange rate. It's a minimum it's a minimum exchange rate. They're saying that um you cannot they would basically they we would guarantee that we, we would give you 1.2 Swiss franc for every you give us one euro. Why? Uh, so, what does that represent? This policy amounts to a 9.2% uh, depreciation in the Swiss franc. So, Swiss franc became 9.2% cheaper compared to euro in just one night. Why was Switzerland doing that? Now, let's look at the exchange rate of Swiss franc to euro uh, around the event. So. This is the um, this is the amount of Swiss franc you can get per euro. What ha what was happening is that from August 31st up to uh, the up to the date of the policy, which is the fifth, which is the fifth, right? What you happening is actually there's a really long trend of Swiss franc appreciating. Uh, Swiss franc is considered sort of a safe harbor currency. Whenever there is some sort of financial trouble, people want to buy Swiss franc. They just feel that it's safe. Right? So Swiss franc has been appreciated, and Switzerland doesn't want that to happen. Why doesn't? Why won't you want your currency to become more and more expensive? Now, what? As your currency becomes more ex where, where your currency become more expensive, what does that do? What does that do to your trade? Think about it. The more expensive your currency is, that means the more expensive your products are. Right? So that means that so uh, appreciating currency would negatively impact exports. Right? So the this policy is aimed to, to stop the hype of the curve of Swiss franc. And it is very effective at the moment of the implementation because you can see one, once you have this policy in place, the curve, the curve, the curve, the Swiss franc becomes a lot cheaper. Right? From a national perspective, if you imagine Switzerland as a, as a store, as a retail store, 
right? That's the same as saying we're going to have a we're going to have an indefinite ten percent off for every product in the country, right? That's something that would be very attractive to people. Now you would start buying their products again because it's cheaper, because it's ten percent cheaper. So countries, whenever countries engage in this type of policy, where they some one way or the other try to lower, try to lower the currency, usually that's for important reasons. And now most countries like to have like the currency to be relatively stable. No one likes the currency to be fluctuating a lot. Keeping your currency cheap, it's relatively easy because. Your country controls how much currency you print, right? If you want, think, if you want your currency to be cheap, just keep printing your currency and give it to whoever wants it. So that's relatively feasible. That's relatively easy to do, right? It's much harder if it's the Iraq when your currency is tumbling and you want to keep it up. That's difficult because what you need to do is you want to, you want, you have to <coughs> reduce the your, you reduce the amount of your currency circulating, and you can only do that by buying them back with some foreign currency. Right. And that would be that's challenging because not every country have a lot of foreign currency in reserve. So that's why defending a currency against depreciation is very difficult. Whereas trying to prevent a currency from appreciating, quite easy, right? If you're willing to do it. So, so the Switzerland Central Bank doing that to so to to preserve its country's export. And Switzerland is certainly not the first country that tries to do that. There are some countries that try to actively de depreciate their currency even though it's not really going up that much. Like Japan, right? The Japanese central bank depreciates the yen intentionally to stimulate the economy. Does it work? Well, it works really well. Like, do you know, so, so, well, you're already young, right, so you probably don't remember. There was a time when, when, Jan, when the exchange rate of Hong Kong dollars to Japanese yen was like, was, was something like 80% higher than now, basically. Like, so, it used to be very expensive to go, oh, it's my phone, but who's calling me? It's the department. Well, just ignore that. Wait, 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 oh, yeah, we'll just call it back later on. Yeah, it shouldn't be anything particularly so serious. Right, so, um, do you know how many people go to Japan every year from Hong Kong? How many people visit Japan every year from Hong Kong? <laughs> so, first, how, how big is Hong Kong? Hong Kong is a city of less, uh, of fewer than 8 million people, right? Okay, 8, 8 million people. How many visits did Hong Kong, did Hong Kong residents make to Japan? In one year, 1.8 million. 1.8 million. Think about it. We have eight million, a population of eight million, and then you have what we made over 1.8 million visits to Japan. It's almost, it's almost like every one in four people in Hong Kong goes to Japan at least once in a year. Now, obviously, um, there are people who go very often, right? There, are, there are people because Hong Kong is five only like five hours of flight from Tokyo. Right? So from Japan, so you could literally go in the weekend if you want. So, but it's a lot of people going to Japan, and if you ask anyone, it's like things are. Everyone feels like things in Japan so cheap. Okay. That is because currency is depreciated, and so this is done by printing yen. Now, in modern economy, you don't actually need to print physical money, even though we like to use the word print. You don't actually print physical money. All it takes is kind of a, like basically you type you type numbers in computers. Uh, what you, every country has a central bank, and central and every bank in a country would every commercial bank in a country would have accounts with central banks with, uh, with their central bank. All the central bank needs to do to increase currency is to type in and to say is to tell all these commercial banks, oh look, you have so much more. I just gave you money in your account. You can take them out and distribute and circulate it. Unless people really need to need paper notes, right? Otherwise, you don't actually need to print anything. 
modern economy, in, the, in modern economy, a lot of transactions, most transactions I would say, happens electronically. So the demand for printing notes actually doesn't go up a lot, even if you print, even if you like increase your money supply. Right? So this is but still, we call them printing money. Right? You're just increasing the money supply. And it works very well. Um, as the time people are still in that, right? The, uh, the, the foreign visitors increased significantly just in a few months, like like reaching a really high amount, three million in in, the, in 2013. Well, as you see, the reason why I choose 2013 is that 2013 is one of the steepest drop in the Japanese yen that yet that has been seen. So it's so so many people was visiting Japan that the travel agency was crying for more manpower. Well, it's not surprising though, because in Japan, if you have been to Japan, Japanese don't speak English, right? So the number of qualified <laughs> qualified tourist guide will probably be very small if you are talking, if you need Japanese guides. Right? So lack of manpower, right? So there's another curve besides demand curve. It's called the angle curve. And uh, the demand curve is between price and quantity. The angle curve is between income and quantity. Basically. Do you buy more things as you get richer? That's the question. Do you buy more things as you get richer? Yes or no? I think if I if I say everything in total, probably. But if I ask you, do you buy a specific item more often as you get richer? Then the answer is not as clear. Right? Do you buy so think about I have this uh, so Let's say, let's say this is your. And so we have we talk about we, we consider income of a person and how much French cuisine he eats and how much McDonald's he eats. For someone who is poor, you don't eat French cuisine. And anyone actually tried French cuisine in Hong Kong, right? In Hong Kong, not in France, but in Hong Kong. Well, French cuisine is rare in Hong Kong. Typically, you have to go to like a five-star hotel to have French cuisine. It costs you like three thousand dollars for a meal, and the dishes are tiny. Right? That's the that's the, that's the signature of French cuisine. It seems like very big plates, very small portions. Right? That's the idea. So you don't eat French cuisine, and you're poor. You eat McDonald's. Right? And the, as you get more money, you might eat more McDonald's right? because you have more money to spend. But when you start getting really rich, then you might start to be, you start to develop a taste for. French cuisine, right? and you start having French cuisine. And if you're really, really rich, then you just eat French cuisine and not McDonald's very often. Right? Um, unless you're Donald Trump, it turned that it was uh, so. It was reported that Donald Trump only only eat McDonald like eat, only eat burgers like from McDonald's because he was afraid that he would be poisoned. Right, so he doesn't trust his cooks. He wants McDonald's. Right. But most of us would not have that worry. We are not the leader of the free world. So as we get richer, we switch to more expensive food. So what you have here is that one type of food you consume more as you get richer. The other type of food you consume less as you get richer. So unlike the relationship between price and quantity, the relationship between income and quantity depends on what type of goods you're talking about. Some basically, you can imagine some of the more desirable things you consume more as you get richer, but some of the less desirable things you consume less. And we have name for that. Uh, so, so, so we have French cuisine and McDonald's, which have completely different relationship between income and quantity. Once again, uh, we obviously controlling every, everything else constant. So, in this particular case, we are assuming the price to be. We are assuming the price to be the same. So let's just say McDonald's hasn't raised its price, but you get richer. Then, then, then you probably still buy less McDonald's. Right? And if the price of French cuisine stays the same, but you get richer, then you eat more French cuisine. But if you get richer, yet French cuisine also get more expensive, then you probably won't eat more French cuisine. Right? So it's all about relative. If you are richer relative to the price, then you consume more. But if you the same, then it doesn't make any difference. Right. 
So, things that you buy more as you get richer, we call a normal good, like car. You, you, any one of you buy a car as a student, not in Hong Kong. If you're in the United States, then you may have been, right? But not in Hong Kong. Owning a car in Hong Kong is very expensive, as we'll talk about later on. But um, car ownership has been going up significantly in Hong Kong because Hong Kong is a very rich place. Like, if you have, like, the, the salary of a high school teacher in Hong Kong is higher than the high salary of a high school teacher in the United States. But for in, for in many areas, of, in many areas that you consider, Hong Kong would be cheaper than the United States. Except, one obviously, in the United States, but many things would be cheaper. So, being a, a lot of occupations, especially professional occupations in Hong Kong, pay very well. So, people are very rich, so they want, and as you get rich, you want to buy a car. That's just something that people want. So, if you earn three thousand, if you earn three thousand dollars a month, you can probably afford a car. What if you earn three hundred thousand dollars a month? Well, I'm not sure how many people who earn three hundred thousand dollars a month and don't have a car. So, you probably have even you probably you could probably afford more than one car even, right? Uh, but in that case, more than one car. More car like that, you probably drive like a. Porsche or like a Ferrari, right? If you think about it, like you rock around Hong Kong, there's, there's actually a large, there's very high number of expensive cars. Like you have almost all these sports cars in Hong Kong, like driving slowly because of the traffic lights. Right? This, look at the point there. The, in Hong Kong, the fastest you can go legally on the street is 110 kilometers an hour on the way to the airport. That's the fastest you can go. These cars can go over 300 kilometers per hour. We're not even eating half its potential, right? But that's Hong Kong, right? So, but these are things that you buy more as you get richer, and we just we have a name. We call them normal good. Things that you buy less as you get richer is called inferior good, like low quality food and clothing, counterfeit items, uh, yeah. I think this is certainly the case. Like, obviously, I don't buy her bags, right? But my, like my sister, right? When she was in, when when she was in school, she would go, she would buy all these handbags look alike from Taobao, right? right? But after she graduated, we don't do that anymore. You start actually buying the real thing. So these things demand goes down as you get richer. So these are called inferior goods. Right. Uh, demand is black. So I think we just uh, so the point of the reason why demand and supply comes to dominate economics discussion is that it's simple. Um, I basically whenever you talk to someone who has studied economics. And when you ask them to explain something that happens in the market, right? Something that has relate has relationship to trading. What they have in mind probably is demand supply diagram. Whenever you have a government when you are whenever you ask them the impact of a government policy that has to do with a market, they would have demand and supply in mind. They would not have utility in mind. They would not have mathematical functions in mind. What they have is a diagram, demand and supply. So it's an intuitive way to give us to tell us how market works and the effect of various events and policies. It's very easy to use, very intuitive. Uh, it's much better than the alternative, like for example, the two person two good model we used last week in like renter and farmer. It's very hard to generalize to more people and more goods, and it doesn't have, and it doesn't really have it doesn't have really have a price. It doesn't have money involved. So, demand supply diagram instead focus on one market at a time. It's like, okay, what happens to the market of iPhones? What happens to the market of um, clothing? What happens in the, all those cases? And a market is four components. What is a market? Well, market means there's something being traded, right? There's something good. It could be a good or it could be a service. Something being traded. There must be buyers, someone's buying, sellers, 
right? You think about I am I am paying you to buy your iPhone. I am the buyer, you are the seller. I'm paying you something for money. I'm paying you a price to get your pro get, get your iPhone. That's the good, right? So I pay you to buy something. For buyers, we have the demand curve. We just talked about demand curve. Basically, what what people want to buy. We're going to assume that we can come up with something similar for the seller. How much? Do you, how many units do you want to sell? Right. Let's call the supplier. So, what do you want to sell? Uh, we're not going to go into details on how you actually uh, calculate find the supply curve now. Uh, instead, let's just think about it. if I ask you this question, how would you? What answer would you give? Right. Think about let's say tutoring children, right? How many hours would you be? How many of you are willing to work to to to, to a primary school children one hour a week? Just one hour, a hundred dollars. Some of you would, some of you would, right? But if I ask you to do for fifty hours, then you're probably not going to do that. Not for this price, since it's going to take up all your time. You're not, right? So you're not probably not going to do that. So typically, we say that when the more you ask from people, the more they want in return. Which is why doctors. And lawyers get paid so much, right? If your doctors have to be on call, right? You have to, you are, all, and you have all, you are, if you are, if, if the, and uh, all say, and same for like bankers, like investment bankers, why would they be, why did they get paid so much? Because you literally sell your life to the company during those, when you work, when you are with the company. Doctors have to stay on, have to be on call. I like investment bankers and lawyers in, involved in commercial operations. You often have to answer clients' inquiries, inquiries at night, right? So why would anyone be willing to sacrifice leisure time and sleep for work? Well, the only reason is it pays so well. So it pays really well, right? Uh, like so, my sister, my ba so my baby sister, she is like uh, she was a corporate lawyer, and she's like six years younger than she, she's six years younger than I am, and she earns more than I do. Like yeah, as a corporate lawyer, she earns so much money. But you don't have. But the thing is, despite how much money she earns, she doesn't have time to spend it. That's the typical dilemma as a doctor or a lawyer. Right? Like, you have so much money, but what do you? You don't have time. So what do you do? Well. It's pretty actually pretty easy for ladies. The thing is, where do all those um, investment banks and law law firms have their offices? Central, central, and like or in uh, the international commercial center in West Kowloon, right? So, all what do you have beneath the offices? Shopping malls, Chanel, Dior, like. Ralph Lauren, why do all these shops open at the base of at the base of all these office towers, and you never see anyone inside? Well, because each item costs so much. All you need is one person walk in every day, and they're gonna probably make that. That would be enough, right? There's people working in those office towers are so busy and have so much money that they would probably won't think twice buying from those shops. Right, that's why you have all these shops here. Right. So, if you ask people to, if you ask people to give more, they would charge you more. That's the idea. So, obviously, uh, we have to once again hold everything constant. Um, from from that, what you would have, you would have an upward sloping curve. And so, what we're going to have is, we're going to start from demand. Each person has a demand. Let's just imagine you ask everyone how much they are willing to pay for a product, right? You ask everyone how much they are willing to pay for a product, and you have a demand curve for every one of them. The market demand is simply the sum of individual demand. So you just, okay, three dollars, how much do you want? Nothing. Three dollars, how much do you want? Nothing. Oh, that's nothing. No demand. Two dollars, how much do you want? Four units. Two dollars, how much does he want? Three units. Total, seven units. That's the idea of market demand. It's just the sum of individual demand. Just keep asking everyone how much they want. Um, 
Similarly, you can do that for supply. Right? You survey the sellers. You survey your sellers. Oh, at 50 cents, how much do you, are you willing to sell? Nothing. How much does he willing to sell? Nothing. Oh, there's no supply. One dollar, how much are you willing to sell? One unit. How much is he willing to sell? Nothing. Oh, that's one unit. And two dollars, how much are you willing to sell? Three units. And how much does he willing to sell? Four units. Put on seven units. And so on. So, Support market supply is just a sum of industry digital supply. It's pretty easy to do that in today's digital economy. And then you put the two lines together. That's the famous cross demand and supply you see in all economic studies. This probably dates back to Alfred Marshall at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, before Albert Marshall, I don't think people really draw diagrams like that. Now, Adam Smith didn't draw any other diagrams. There was no diagram in Wealth of Nations. Wealth of Nations would, to, to the, from, would be more like what you consider like philosophical textbooks these days, right? Just long, very long essays. People would, would uh, that that's about sort of a logical process, right? Just keep writing, writing, writing. But diagrams, this is this is, this would be a breakthrough and it happened probably sometime in early 20th century. Right? So you have this diagram which tells you what people want and what sellers want to sell. How is the price set up? You can even if you imagine price the price is somewhere is somewhere pretty high, like two dollars fifty cents. You can imagine that a new, if this is, if the sellers are new to the market, they would, they might be charging a relatively high price if they don't know what people are willing to sell. What would happen? Now, sellers would want to sell a lot, as you can see. So, what does seller want to sell? Seller, want, what seller wants to sell is given by the supply curve, which is here. Oops. This is what the seller wants to sell. But that's higher than what the buyers want to buy, which is here. Whenever you have something like that happens, what ha well, what would happen? Typically, what you have you're going to have is a sell, right? When would so products that get sold out never go on sale, right? So when does iPhones ever go on sale? iPhones never go on sale. Right? You don't, it doesn't need to go on sale. It's, but products that no one wants go on sale. So what would happen is, if a seller realized that it, if no one's buying this product, then it would lower its price, go on sale. So we say that, we'll say that there's a surplus in this market. So too much. When things there are too much, there, when there are too much product and no one wants to buy, things get cheaper. <laughs> So prices to go down. What if price is too low? Uh, for in this case, well, what would happen? There are many reasons why my price could start off being too low. Now, one is sometimes government limit price, right? In Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong actually is a pretty free economy, but there are exact there are examples that you could imagine, like uh, some in, like us. Uh, the um, taxi is regulated in Hong Kong, so sometimes taxi, some like this, uh, you might find no taxi because too many people want to ride taxi. But Hong Kong is not a very good example because Hong Kong doesn't really control it; has doesn't have many much uh, many private control. Uh, but there are rent control in many countries. Right? So in other cases, in other cases, there are cases where demand simply exceeds what the seller can produce. Like Apple, then Apple could easily charge a much higher price during its launch of iPhones, right? Yet even at ten, uh, even at ten thousand dollars, ten thousand Hong Kong dollars, plenty of people want the iPhone X. It could charge fifteen thousand dollars or even twenty thousand dollars, and I would say it probably still sell. But it's, so, what happens in Tokyo? Those cases, right? So, 
In this case, the seller is not producing a lot, but the buyers want a lot. So either the buyers are going to bid up the price or sellers are going to demand a high price. So in most cases, at least for, non, uh, for small sellers, they typically raise price for their products. In, yet, there are some special cases that sellers choose not to do so, like Apple. Despite the predictable high demand for iPhones, Apple's, Apple typically do not raise, well, Apple never raises price for that reason. Apple won't raise its price simply because so many because so simply because many people want its iPhone very much. It doesn't do that. Right. What happens in that case? Does that mean that everyone gets to buy an iPhone at the original retail price? Um, anyone actually engage in iPhone arbitrage in Hong Kong? Right. It's pretty. It's, a, it's something that students do in Hong Kong sometimes. Like, how I don't, like, buy iPhones and then you sell them. So, in Hong Kong, if you officially buy from Apple, obviously you pay the retail price. But, if, but there are also authorized resellers in Hong Kong, like uh, Fortress, Broadway. And sometimes what they would do is at launch, when iPhones are in shortage, they would require you to buy something else in addition to an iPhone, sometimes accessories. You are, will be required to buy accessories at a very high markup price in order to get an iPhone. That's one way for them to increase their profit. Another example is actually I brought some. It's once again related to Bitcoin cryptocurrency. So this, I just brought this from my office. This thing, if you know, well, for probably for people who are actually interested in computer technology, this is more expensive. This is more valuable than gold these days. It's harder to find in gold. So this is a graphics card. This is a very this is a high-end graphics card. Uh, it's in it's in severe shortage these days. Like I was in the computer mall like yesterday. I didn't this I didn't brought this yesterday, but I was in the computer mall yesterday, and this model is completely out of stock, pretty much in Hong Kong. You can't buy it. And if you the reason is obviously cryptocurrency not specifically bitcoin because uh but something very similar to bitcoin you might have heard of called ethereum ethereum prices have been going up such as like bitcoin and in order to mine to mine ethereum you need graphics card like this one right it's enormous like if you want to play look inside i actually bought it here so that's why i have to be very careful this this is really valuable these days so, but if you take a look, it's enormous piece of equipment. Well, these things are supposed for gaming. At least they're supposed for playing video games, but no one buy them. For, well, a lot of people buy buying them not for video games. It's so, it's an enormous piece of equipment, right? It's enormous piece of equipment. You put it in your com desktop computer. And then you run a program, and that's all it takes to start mining Ethereum. Program. So you just need this thing in your computer, then you run a program. Right. It run, that's how you mine things. Now, this thing, as here, there's a fan here, right? So why does it have a fan? It's a fan because this thing gets very hot. It takes a lot of power. Um, if you have a few of these things in your room, you don't need a heater. It's very hot. Right? So, so um, you run these. You, you so you run so you run these things, and so I think the reason why, is besides the price, is that it's winter, right? So it's relatively cheap to run these things at winter, since you don't need air con turn on air conditioning, right? So because of the high price, um, there's no there's it's exposed a lot of supply. Um, not just in Hong Kong. I think the reason why supplies are so it's in such a shortage in Hong Kong is that I think mainland Chinese are buying, also buying these cars from Hong Kong to bring back to China for their uh, for mining operations. So what happened? What do you mean by mining? Oh, so so mining is the well mining is the name of the process of 
gaining cryptocurrency through processing transactions. The way cryptocurrency works is it's all digital, right? There's no central bank, there's no bank at all. So when I want to trade with you, we need the record to be verified and kept in a, and kept in a in place, right? So I want to trade with you. Someone has to verify this trade. How do you do that? Well, the process is done through some very complicated map. So, and you need a third party willing to do the complicated map to verify this trade. Why would anyone be willing to do complicated map? There must be some reward. So all cryptocurrencies are designed to reward the, the person, the computer, that, that process the trade with some new coins, from with some new cryptocurrency. So when I trade with some, let's say if I trade with her, and you process our when and you process our transaction, you would be rewarded with some newly generated cryptocurrency. And that's your that's your reward for be willing to be the processor, the, the one to process the transaction. This process is called mining. This process is mining. What you're doing is actually processing transactions. Right? Now because you because because the reward is so lucrative these days due to the high price of Bitcoin and similar cryptocurrencies, you actually have a lot of people competing to tra process transactions. That's the idea. The reason is the, 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 the reason why the, 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 the whole system is designed to operate this way, to attract people to process the payment through giving people newly newly created cryptocurrency as we want. Uh, that's all how that's how it works. The, because, but it's because it involves calculating very complicated math, you need very powerful computer chips to do that. Um, your computer generally have a CPU, central processing unit, that's not very that's not very um, suitable for processing cryptocurrency transactions. Um, graphics processor like this one, which is designed for video games, they are much better they're much better in processing and doing those math. So what you typically do these days, if you are one person, like a student in the dormitory, you probably buy one, a few of, one or two of these and plug into your gaming computer. When you're playing games, you play games. You don't play games like during when you're in class. You run the computer to mine cryptocurrency. If you are in commercial operations, then you could have dozens or hundreds of these cards running at the same time. right? Commercial operations typically don't operate in Hong Kong because think about it, four of these would would be would be the equivalent of a space heater. If you have thousands, it would be a burning. It would be like a burning furnace. So you don't run these in Hong Kong. You shouldn't be running somewhere actually a lot cooler to run the year. right? So something somewhere up now. China and second, these things take a lot of electricity. So where is the fact? So you need cheap electricity in order to be profitable. You don't really want to run it at home because electricity is going to be expensive. Where do you want to run it? Somewhere electricity cheap is cheap. Where where would electricity be cheap? Dormitories. That's why students. That's why students are so happy in mining bitcoins and and Ethereum because they don't pay for the electricity. I, it would be actually very interesting to ask the university to see if they have any figures on the. On how the electricity usage relative to cryptocurrency prices, right? But in China, that's one of the biggest advantages of China is the abundance of hydropower. China that comes to dominate Bitcoin mining because of cheap electricity. So yeah, cryptocurrency is a very interesting topic because it's so it's it's very it's just so hot. Such a hot topic now, right? Everyone is fascinated by cryptocurrency. So, yeah, we can talk more about that you know, in the future. Yeah, but this is valuable. These, these things actually, now, typically, technology, like um, technology, any tech products, usually price goes down in time, right? iPhone, like, new, every new generation of iPhone becomes more expect, becomes, becomes more powerful than the last generation, but it costs the same. Sometimes even cheaper in the case of um, iPad. You could go cheaper. Right? Computers barely cost more than 10 or 20 years ago. 
Actually, computers cost less than 10 or 20 years ago, but they are way more powerful. That's normal. But these things has been getting more expensive due to the shock, due to shortage. Well, it's bad. It's, so it's a good time. If, it's good time if you are some if, if if you are someone who likes building computers to make money. It's a bad time if you just want to play video games because it's very hard to get come get these things come by. Right. So that's so shortage. So we should you say the market has a shortage. What happens? So uh, pay more basically the month pay more. Price is going up because of shortage. Right, so when price reaches $2, the quantity buyer wants to buy and the quantity sellers want to sell is equal. So this is what we call a market equilibrium. Right, that's the famous cross intersection. And the price is the equilibrium price and the quantity is the equilibrium quantity. And what does it mean? Market equilibrium is a situation where the uh, quantity demand equals quantity supply. And that's a, graphically that's the intersection. But what does it mean? In, now it means that various forces are in balance. No one has pressure to change. At this price, if you're willing to sell 10 units, you can sell 10 units on average. If you are willing to buy five units, you can buy five units on average. It does not mean that everyone gets what they want. Because as consumers, I always want lower prices, right? The, like, yes, I can get as many iPhones as I wish at the current price of $5,000. Doesn't mean that I don't want iPhones to cost me $2,000 only, right? As a consumer, I always want products to be cheaper. Similarly, as a seller, Yes, Apple can sell as many iPhones as you wish at the current price, but maybe, well, but you bet Apple would be very happy if you can sell for even more for the same units, right? So, market equilibrium is a balance between the, the, the what consumers want and what the sellers want. It's not, it's, it's a balance of what they want. It's not them exactly getting what they, what they want. It's just a balance. Because what they want is opposite of each other. One wants a higher price, one wants a lower price. Okay, so actually I think we're going to end here because demand shock is going to take more time. So, So a vertical demand curve is the one of the extreme cases where the demand curve is just vertical. What, does, what happens in that case? Let's take a look. In, with this demand curve, 
it doesn't matter what the supply the level of supply is if it's expensive if it's if it's expensive the seller the buyer is just going to pay more but he always want the same quantity like perhaps one right something like that so this buyer always want the same quantity always wants the same quantity regardless of the price this now this cannot literally be true because everyone runs out of money eventually so i think a more realistic case would be something like this that it goes up and then it drops to zero when it's too expensive that's probably more realistic because no one has an infinite amount of wealth so what would be an example what would be an example and i think an example would be something like a cd right or a mu uh, music you purchase from itunes regardless of how uh, for one specific uh, one specific cd i think regardless of how cheap it gets it's very rare that you're going to buy two right there's no need for two this is not true for cds or music in or music or music in general because when music gets cheaper you buy more songs but for one particular song or one particular cd i think it's quite fair to say that even if it gets very cheap you're unlikely to buy two so that's one example of very good uh, case where you just need a specific amount and not more the other extreme is the case when it's the demand is horizontal so that the buyers want to buy as many units as possible at a particular price so you can see that in this case you can see that in this case the buyer buys more the, the buyers buy more when supply is higher the only the only um the only thing that that they look at is kind of the price right if the price if, if the if the price is right they buy as many units as possible so price does not change even when there's a supply shock can you give me any example that's the case the shop where everything is one dollar or ten dollars so um like a dollar store right like a dollar so like in the dollars but you see in the dollar store do you, you you don't try to buy up as many units. Let's say I need a lot of files, right. a lot of stationery, and everything is the same price. Right. So it's stationery. I need so it's something that you need so much that you're willing to buy up as many as available at that price. Yeah. For example, right. like I lose pens every day. Right. So I'll buy like. No, it's true. I lose a lot of pens. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's that's actually. Yeah, that's actually very close, very close to what this diagram is meant to represent. This has to be a situation where the de well, the demand has to be high enough that it would take all the units available. This diagram is so now what this diagram tries to say is that you you're somehow very price actually very price sensitive because. If the price is just slightly more expensive, you're actually not going to buy from this seller. Right. But if the seller, if the price is right, you're willing to buy as many as possible. I think actually it makes a lot of sense. The dollar store example is where it makes a lot of sense. If there's a, if you, if you, if a, if you see pens selling for two dollars, you might not buy any because you know there's a store, there there is a dollar store around. That's willing to sell you pens for one dollar each. So what this demand curve says is that there must be some. Well, it represents it's a situation where you have alternatives. You can buy pens for one dollar. You know you can buy pens for one dollar, so you're unwilling to pay two dollars. You are in fact unwilling to pay one dollar ten cents because you know there's something somewhere you can buy for one dollar, right? So. 
what this die, what this system, what this, where this demand curve shows up is in the model of perfect competition. This demand is used is this demand is used in that model because in that model there's a it's assumed that that there's intense competition. If a seller cannot charge more than the price being charged by its competitor. Right, so it's like a dollar store. Dollar store has to be selling for one dollar because if you're not selling one dollar, then everyone will go to the ones that actually sell for one dollar. Right, so there's no demand for your there's no right, there's no demand for a product if you are selling more selling at a price higher than your competitors. And then the market is large enough such that if you are selling at the market price, there will be enough demand for your product. You can sell as much as you need. It's a very stylized model. It push, it's in some sense, it's pushing the idea of competition to the extreme. That cons consumers are really, really price sensitive. Because in reality, I don't think people are necessarily that price sensitive. There will be people who are willing to pay two dollars for a pen, despite the fact that they are pens for one. You can get they can get pens for one dollar somewhere else. But there are there are people who are not that price sensitive. So the model actually pushed the assumption of prices to the extreme. People only shop at the cheapest location, and it also says that there are a lot of sell, there are a lot of buyers that that's enough to satisfy the quantity supplied by sellers. Right. So this is a but this is a bench also the benchmark model. When when it comes when people when uh, economists investigate what happens in when you have intense competition, this model would give would tell you what happens in the extreme case when there's so much competition that there is no that, that sellers are, sellers have to be very uh, sellers and buyers are all have very sensitive to price. What happens? Right. This is what happens. You get no business if you sell at a high price. You get a lot of business if you sell at the market price. Right. Well, why don't we sell cheaper? Well, that gives you the assumption that there is you can already sell as much as you need at the market price. Right. Um, we'll talk more about that later on in the uh, in the future. So now the supply curve, a vertical supply curve. They can so the quantity supply is fixed regardless of price. So you can simply cannot produce more. What kind of products can you not produce more? So even if sellers, even if buyers are willing to pay, there is no way to produce more. Like plane tickets. Well, you can plane tickets. I would say for specific flight. Yeah. yeah. Probably not. For specific, <laughs> yeah, for a specific flight. I'm not sure. I, I have no idea. I think it's probably not possible. But theoretically, I can imagine an airline switching to a larger flight, right? But, uh, let's yeah. say I have a fleet of 787, 737. Right, but in a short period of time, certainly not possible. Yeah, so, so, so in a I would say, yeah, for a particular flight, it's probably very difficult to increase the, increase the supply of tickets. What about like, uh, if you're getting a haircut, like a person can do so many haircuts at a time, so it's definitely... I think haircut is actually less. If you have person, then right, but then you can take he can he can work over time, right? Maybe he's he intends to take off at five p.m. But there's no limit. Not in Hong Kong. So much. <laughs> 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 okay, let's say a doctor, right? Yeah. Or let's say a dentist. <laughs> okay. Let's say a dentist. He has appointments every fifteen minutes, right? Right. So from nine to five. And at five o'clock, his mother is dying, so he needs to go anywhere. Right. So in that case, like when you have a really, really strict, some sort of really strict constraint where they cannot work over time, then that would be something similar. Although, but then you have the other round because if the if the demand for the for the hairdresser or the doctor for the hairstylist or the demand for the doctor's surface is so low, I would say they're probably not going to reduce the price to a point. They're not going to charge a very low price to fill up their schedule. They might just take the day off. It's possible that's the case, right? If the if like I like if for a case of plane tickets, I think it's actually better because 
airlines do sell tickets on or do put tickets on sale when they can't fill a plane. So we do know that happens because but for for people, I think they would not be willing to work for a very low salary just to fill up their time. But can you think of any products that even over a long period of time you can't increase the supply? Like example in your PowerPoint. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think artwork is a, a, a and like especially antique artwork is would be one example, right? Uh, there's no way you can increase the supply of Mona Lisa because well, Leonardo da Vinci is dead, right? So you can't anything you produce would be a would be like copy. Which cannot sell for the same price. Right. Um, that's not to say that's not true for living artists. Art because the living artists can produce more copies if there's actually a lot of demand for the for the products. Right? Yeah, well not it's not gonna be the same copy. Yeah. But then you're going through emotional trauma and right. express it and hard work and you're over it another one. Right. So modern artists modern artists tend to be more productive. I think modern artists can be very productive if there is demand. Like Picasso is really productive. There's he completely put out a lot of paintings very quickly because they sell for so much. So something that you cannot increase in 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 terms of increase in supply. That actually happens quite a bit. As I said, as like plane tickets in a short period of time, you simply cannot increase or reduce the supply. Over the long run, they do, right? Yeah, everything changes. Right, in the long run, they can do that. Right, finally. Horizontal supply. When things are horizontal, it's always kind of weird. So this is a case where uh, you can get as much as you need as long as you're willing to pay a certain price. But as I said, it's kind of hard to think of something that has infinite supply. Uh, examples that I can think of would be like air on planet Earth, right? Obviously, oxygen would be in shortage in space. But would I would say would we have a right? I mean, in some countries, basically, you can you can get, earn money by giving your blood. So, but there's not an infinite supply of blood, right? I mean, there is, right? Every you know, let's say disregarding this, every I mean, yeah, over time, like if you think about like in your what well, then you talk well, as an adult male can give like can donate blood about three times a year, so. Well, but then so over many years you could you could give quite a few times. But then I would say even in the most optimistic case, right now it's gonna be difficult to give more than two hundred times, right? Over your lifespan. So but yeah, I mean, yeah. there there is supply, there is fixed price. And so I would say yeah, once again it's sim I would say similar to what we have in the case of a vertical demand. Is that you can say that Maybe someone is willing to give or donate blood for for a certain value. It could be zero, right? It could be zero. They are willing to supply up to a point at, at which they won't be able to supply anymore, like in that. So it could be something like that. But I think there are examples like these where, like air, you could get as you could get as much air you need, or as long as you stay on planet Earth. Or seawater, you can get as much seawater as you need in a place like Hong Kong, right? Not for fresh water. Fresh water is going to be in short supply. Desalination. Right. So yeah, so that's why salt water is a good choice, right? Because you have enough salt water that you can you can pump it up and desalt. Yeah, use desalination. Um. So these are things that might be might you, you might consider having a large enough supply where, as long as you're willing to pay a fixed price to process them, then it's in essentially infinite supply. Right, so one thing that you would notice that is that in, in economics, we really talk about absolute change. You would realize that uh, now the most common measure of change is slope, right? This is something you learn in like secondary school. Right? When y increased by three units, uh, y increased by three units when x increased by one unit, and we say the slope is change, the slope of change is three. In economics, we don't use the slope very often for the following reason. Suppose y is iPad sales and x is price of an iPad. If x is measured in dollars and iPad sales goes up by 100 units, when the price is lower by one dollar, then the slope is negative 100. Because price change is positive one, 
quantity change is negative 100. So it's, the slope is negative 100. Well, if we use cents as the unit of money, however, the slope is negative 1. Well, there's no reason why you have to use dollar as the measure, as the unit of measure, right? It's very common to use different units depending on the size of the transaction you're talking about. So you could you could use cents, you could use millions of dollars, right? And the slope would change depending on your unit of measurement. Not to mention what happens if you're using different currency. Right? So we don't in economics we don't really we don't like this issue. Right? The use of slope is dependent on the unit of measure. And we don't like that. So what can you do? You can use in economics we should really use percentage change. Right? So y increased by 3% when x increased by 1%, in, this is called elasticity. The percentage change of y over the percentage change of x. Or the percentage change of the result O divided by the percentage change of the cost. This is called elasticity. And so we, in this particular example, the way we, we describe it as the elasticity of y with respect to x is free. It's unit invariant. Because one a hundred dollar increase to one hundred one dollar is a one percent change, and so does ten thousand cents to ten thousand and hundred cents. So percentage change solves that problem for us. So economists typically talk in elasticity, and depending on the elasticity of the of the curve in concern, we have we describe it as either elastic when the when, when elasticity is bigger than one, that means the, res the percentage change in the response is stronger than the percentage change in the cost. If the elasticity is more than one, we call it inelastic. So the response is weaker than the cost. The, re the change in the response is weaker than the change in the cost. And, and finally, if it's just if the magnitude is the same, then we just call it un uh, unitary elastic. Um, let me see how much time you have. Still have some time. So these are terms that you use a lot. So when people say uh, el uh, the, the, uh, elastic demand, that means that uh, well, that's what I'm going to talk about now. When people say elastic demand, that means that consumers are very price sensitive because the response is the quantity and the cost is the price. So price elasticity of demand is the is the percentage change in quantity demand when price goes up by one percent. So this should be negative because price goes up, you buy less. The thing is, if you read textbooks, you would very often find that price elasticity of demand is quoted as a positive number. Now that's because economists are lazy. Given the, that the fact that law of demand says price elasticity of demand should always be negative, why bother writing the negative sign? So they just write a number. So you see that in textbooks sometimes that the price elasticity of demand is quoted as a positive number, even though it's a, it's a negative relationship. Worse still, this is the only place we do that. So when you see a price elasticity of demand of three. That means that the quantity demand drops by 3% when the price goes up by 1%. Right? So when you so when you when you see a price elasticity of demand that is positive, it means a negative relationship. <coughs> what if you see a price elasticity of demand that is negative? It still implies a negative relationship. So it's just that, as I said, economists drop the negative sign. So, but some do, some don't. So, just interpret it as a negative number always. Yeah, just interpret it as a number always. And this is the only case you do that. In all the other case, negative means a negative relationship, positive means a positive relationship. So, if you link up with a diagram, elast elastic means more responsive, to, more res sensitive to price change. So, the, if you have two curves passing the same point, the steeper demand curve has a small elast elasticity because we just said steeper curve means less sensitive to price change. Elastic means sensitive to price change. So steeper means less elastic. 
a vertical demand curve with an elasticity of zero because there is no uh, there's no response. Right? Doesn't matter what the price is. Same quantity. Doesn't matter what the price is. I always buy the same unit. So there is no response. And the horizontal demand curve has an elasticity of infinite because it's really, really price sensitive. You charge me 10 cents more and I don't buy from you. So that's very high sensitivity. Um, there is also you can also use elasticity to measure the pro you can measure uh, the relationship between different products. What happens when there's a change in the price of another good or a change in the income? So the cross price elasticity of demand is the percentage change in the quantity demand of one good with respect to one percent increase in the price of another good. That's something that you would measure. As I said, when you want to see how close two products are in, as substitutes. So Coca Cola and Pepsi would have really high cross price elasticity of demand. Price of Coca Cola goes up, you would expect demand of Pepsi would noticeably go up. So that's substitutes. But if you have case, if you have things that you, that you use together, when gas, when the price of gasoline goes up, you see that demand for cars goes down, at least demand for cars that use a lot of gasoline. So those are called complements because they use them together. And one thing that is quite interesting you can see from is that in the, in the case of rice export. So what I want you to notice is the price change in the price change of Thai rice. So take a look at the change of uh, a change of quantity of Thai rice. Um, this, do you notice that the export of the rice export of Thailand dropped substantially from 2011 to 2012, right? So ta rice is one of the major export of Thailand, and especially to places like Hong Kong, where we really like Thai fragrant rice. So it's kind of curious that Thailand somehow export almost 30 percent less in one year. So that's actually not an accident. It's, it's actually intentional. It was a policy implemented by the government to, uh, in 2012. So uh, if you are familiar with Thai, Thailand politics, then you know that the Shina Lakpra family like, was, a, a, was, uh, was very popular among the rural peasants, the rural farmers. So they implement this policy to, in the hope of pushing up the price of rice in the international market. So what they did was that uh, the government of the Yingluk, uh, the uh, government in the government would buy rice, would, the government would buy rice from the farmers, stockpile it, in hope of pushing up the international price. And they did succeed. Well, take a look at the rice price. In the same period of time. The price of Thai rice did go up, but not by a significant amount. How come? Take a look at India's and Viet uh, India's export. While, while Thailand was reducing export, India increased its export enormously in the same year. That more than make that is more than enough to cover the reduction in supply of time. So something that you would notice here is that you can see that even though Thailand reduced its reduced its supply, India make up for it, and there's almost no change in Thailand right in Thai, in the price of Thailand's rice. Right. So uh, the fine. So this actually toppled in English government in part, right? She was, she was also charged with misappropriating government's fund in this scheme. And this policy was declared a failure by 2014 because you can see Thailand start increasing its supply again, right? So substitute, you, you, you cannot underestimate 
whether your uh, whether there are substitutes for your products. Thailand completely overestimated how unique their rice was. Right? It turns out people are more than willing to switch to Indian rice. Right, so income elasticity is the percentage change in quantity of demand with respect to 1% change in income. So if your income goes up and your demand goes up, that's a positive income elasticity of demand, and that's normal good. And a negative elasticity of demand would in income elasticity of demand would be our case when demand goes down with income, so that's inferior good. So, right, so these are just quantitative measures that economists would use when they try to characterize the goods. You can measure these from data you have on product records. Right. So you can also further divide goods into cases where people buy proportionately more and proportionately less. So if you get if you get one percent richer, do you buy what do you buy more than one percent or less than one percent of that product? Uh, there are products that you certainly buy more as you get richer, like cars, handbags. So those are usually we call luxuries, things that you only start buying when you get richer. There are other things where you might buy more, but you don't buy proportionally more. Like table salt. Um, my income is a lot my income is certainly a lot higher than when I first started teaching, but I don't buy more table salt than before. Because I don't need more table salt than before. You need table salt, but you don't need more as you get richer. So we call those things necessities, things that you do not need more as you get, you do not need a lot more as you get richer. So, so these are just name terms used to describe things. And, all right, this is a case that I actually want to talk about. How much smuggling was there from Hong Kong to China? Oh, in case you are, you are new to Hong Kong, a lot. So this is a photo taken in the Xiangshui station, which is the last stop before crossing the border. So what are these people doing? These are smuggled goods. Now, goods that brought in goods that are brought into China legally have to pay a pretty heavy tax. So that and Hong Kong, on the other hand, is a tax-free is a tax-free city. So that gives a, there's a very strong incentive. For, to, for moving goods illegally from Hong Kong to China. And, in, and the thing is, it's not that difficult to move things illegally from Hong Kong to China. These people are taking the subway. They're taking the subway. They take, you can see, they're taking like boxes on the subway to China, and you need to pass through customs in the process. Or you, well, you kind of have to say, well, this is what, well, this, yeah, this is for my family or something. If you have to, if, and once you cross the border, literally once you cross the border and exit custom, there are people stationed outside of the train station waiting to purchase these products from these smugglers. So uh, these people, these people, they can take several trips a day, earning something like a couple, maybe a, like like something like a fifty dollars or hundred dollars each time. So they take multiple trips because there's a while the subway, while MTR, the subway company, does not set, does, does not check for smuggling, they do check your luggage size, which is why you can't take more. They, you can see that they are only taking a certain, about the same size, right? This is the maximum size you can take across the with subway, right? But these are actually small potatoes, right? These are actually, these are actually. Tiny, tiny operations compared to the biggest one in China, the Yunhua smuggling case. The Yunhua smuggling case was uh, masterminded by this guy. Anyone know who this guy is? This is called he's Lai Chen Sing. Uh, he smuggled 53 billion, 53 billion renminbi worth of food to China. Uh, he is like he he has a really big operation. And resulting in 30 billion tax evasion. Um, so he actually uh, he escaped to Canada. He escaped to Canada after the operation was busted, and he stayed in Canada. Uh, the Canadian government, the Canadian, the Canadian government did not uh, did not return him to China initially. 
until the Chinese government promised that he would not be executed. Because Canada does not have uh, capital punishment. So Canada was unwilling to return him to China for that reason. But yeah, after the Chinese government promised that he would not be executed, then he was returned to China to face trial. But what I want you to notice in this case is that notice the amount of tax evasion. 30 billion tax evasion out of 50 billion, 3 billion of food smuggled in. That's really high tax rate, right? That's 60% tax rate. So that tells you why there's such a strong incentive to smuggle into China because China used to have really high tax rate. And it's not a surprise, it's not surprising because for a while, for a while it's actually uh, protectionism was quite in favor. So you and what, how do you protect the domestic industry by charging a very high tax on imports? So what's the benefit of money? A voting tax, right? So import tax is called tariff. So in, a voting tax. And what you would expect is the higher the tax rate, the bigger the benefit of smuggling. No one will smuggle for one or two percent tax rate, but sixty percent. That's a very that's a very big incentive. So naturally, because the tax rate is in percentage, so naturally you would use elasticity. So when there's one percent increase, because when the tax rate go up by one percent, how much more smuggling do you expect? That's something that we are trying to that we're going to talk about in a moment. But first. How do you measure smuggling, which by definition is legal? How do you measure something? How do you measure something that is illegal? How do you do that? This actually requires some clever uh, uh, understanding of how tax, how the uh, how import and export works. So now these are what we're going to talk about is systematic smuggling by companies, not by individuals. As a company, what incentive do you face? Now, uh, obviously, this is one form of smuggling, right? This is one form of smuggling. But this is a very dangerous form of smuggling. In, uh, fortunately, he's carrying iPhones. He's not carrying Sam, like Samsung Galaxy Notes. Uh, otherwise, he's probably going to be, be, like, it's going to be very dangerous. But this is not something that is Scalable, right? This is not scalable. So what you want, what what they do is usually what you do is doctoring documents instead of actually sending people across the border like that. The thing is, Hong Kong is a free trade port. Hong Kong does not place any restriction on what you can, pretty much no restriction on what you can export. Uh, there's some restriction on things like firearms and uh, drugs, but there's not much restriction otherwise. So in Hong Kong, there's actually not there's no incentive to lie to the government officials on what you export. It's completely legal to export whatever you want. The problem is China Chinese custom because of the high tariff of China of China, Chinese custom would want to know what you're importing, right? And here is where you want to lie. You don't want to tell them you're importing something that is uh, that is that could be taxed at a very high rate, right? So the key understanding is that the, the incentive to lie comes from, uh, it's, comes from China side, not from the Hong Kong side. So what do you do? Now let's say you want to export some iPhones from Hong Kong to China, right? Just for example. You can totally tell Hong Kong government that you're exporting iPhones. That's okay, it's completely legal. In fact, it would be illegal to lie. So there's no cause in telling the truth here in Hong Kong because you can export whatever you want. If you lie though, and the government discovered that you lie, like by because do, when doing do, doing random checks, then you would be in serious trouble because you lie to the government. So in Hong Kong, it's completely odd. Companies would tend to report the truthful. And then you could think your product on a truck, it passed through the passed through the border, and somehow when the truck passes through the border, your product are no longer iPhones. It could become jelly beans or something. Right? So you, now, uh, in reality, it's not going to be that extreme. What would actually happen is something like uh, you would report your product as something that is less expensive. iPhones are very expensive. 
So instead of them, the Chinese customs that you're importing iPhones, you want to tell them that you're importing some like low end feature phone, right? Dumb phones. So that's in general, that's the way you do systematic smuggling. Import something expensive and report it as something cheap. But that's what you do. that's what you want to do. So I can smuggle let's say cocaine and say it's flour. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, unfortunately, we won't observe that in Hong Kong because reporting that you're exporting cocaine will be illegal. Right? Exporting cocaine is legal. Right? But the idea is the same. Yeah, you could, you want to report what you are importing as something else. And we do have record of that. You can compare Hong Kong's export statistics to China and to China's import statistics from Hong Kong. These are data that you can obtain freely. Yeah. All right. So, so let's see. Um, so this, uh, this is a, so this, so this is the data that from a particular year. This is for 1998. The, the, the vertical, the, the vertical. Uh, so each dot represents one product. Each dot is one product. Right? Each dot is one product. The vertical axis is. Hong Kong's export statistics minus China's import statistics. Positive means Hong Kong say is exporting more than China say is importing. If if the record is perfect, you would expect the two numbers to be the same and the difference to be zero. Right? Positive a positive difference means Hong Kong say is exporting a lot to China, but China say is not export, importing that much from Hong Kong. A negative number would be the would be the other way around. Hong Kong say is not exporting that much, but China says importing a lot from Hong Kong. The horizontal axis is the tax rate, right? So what relationship do you see? As the tax rate goes up, it's quite clear that. As the, as the tax rate goes up, the difference between what Hong Kong say is exporting and what China say is importing gets bigger. It's not going to allow. This is uh, this is uh, data analysis 101. Data, data is not going to line up nicely on a line. That never happens. But the general trend seems to be quite clear. As as the uh, as the tax rate goes up. The difference is bigger. It's quite surprising. It might surprise you, but that China actually charged over 100% tax on some products. See, this is 100% tax. Yeah, China tax double the tax. Well, that's actually not so surprising if you're in Hong Kong because Hong Kong we do that too. Um, automobiles are charged 100% tax in Hong Kong, so we do that too. So. Do you have to pay the same price to the government? So you pay for the car and then you have to pay like. Like, as if you were paying for the second car, but you're paying it to the government. So what you do is this. So when you buy a car, you have to register the car with a new car. You have to register with the government. The government is going to charge 100% of the declared value of the vehicle. Right. So yeah. So it's the, it's the government's way of limiting automobiles in Hong Kong. Yeah. Singapore is even worse. Yeah. So. In Singapore, you have to you have to you have to go for, you know auction for they have auction for license, so the highest bidder wins. Yeah, yeah don't wear Ferrari. <laughs> well, you could. You could. Yeah, you could. Well, but the, yeah. So the thing is, if that if that's, if that 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 happens. So what happens is tax rate is very high. And one thing you want to uh, one thing that's very interesting is that not only there is a systematic positive difference at the top. Right, there is also a systematic difference that is negative in the bottom. One interpretation is that what happening is that this is evidence that, or the, 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 this is evidence of misreporting. You are reporting ex uh, expensive and high tax rate items as cheap and low tax rate items. So, if you do that, this is what you expect. Because so somehow China is importing a lot of cheap phones from Hong Kong. 
But Hong Kong says exporting a lot of iPhones to China. That would be that would be what happened in this case. Right. So the estimated effect is of elasticity of three. That is, for every one percent in tax rate, China would be there would be a three percent increase in smuggling based on these records. So is it worthwhile? So is it that well as a policy? Would it be a good idea for China to lower its tariff, lower its tax rate for imports? If you if this relationship holds, then it would be beneficial for China to reduce its uh will reduce its tax rate because you gain three percent in revenue for every one percent drop in tax rate. Right? But clearly, in uh, the tax, the import tax is not meant to earn money. It's not meant to raise revenue. The import tax is usually in place to protect domestic industry. So this alone is not something that would convince government to reduce tax rate. Right. But then China, the, but then China eventually joined the WTO, and tax rate is no longer that high anymore. But it's still pretty high. So today, even today. It's, you don't want to bring a brand new iPhone across the border because if you bring a brand new iPhone in package across the border, you will be asked to pay tax when you pass the border. Uh, if you get if you get caught, that is right. So that's why um, it's general. And if you try to ship, if you try to mail, if you try to mail an iPhone to someone you know in China, you definitely have to take out the app. You have to like. Um, you have to definitely take apart the uh, packaging because you would definitely be taught. Well, you won't. Whoever the recipient will be asked to pay tax on the iPhone if you, if they receive a shipment of an iPhone, right? Which is why you have these people who have all these iPhones around the body, right? Because that's the cheapest way to bring iPhones to China for some for a certain period of time, right? So. Uh, incidentally, uh, this paper, this is a paper that is, that is written uh, by one of the, by the author of one of the books that you can choose from. Uh, that's the one, the Economic Gangsters. So that's this written by the author. This, so that author, uh, that author studies a lot of uh, the econo well, study economics of these developing countries. So he has a lot of interesting incidents like that in the book too. Right. All right. So for, so now I think we covered. Most of the things I want to cover.